WXII 12 News at 10 on the Triad CW starts now. We have new information on this Monday night about the search for a missing woman from Burlington. Plus. It was a little scary when we did realize that the whole basement was full of water. In the wake of last week's flooding, here from a restaurant owner still trying to get all the water out as we prepare for more rain in our forecast. But first, the UNCG student is recovering right now. They were hit by a campus police cruiser tonight. Yeah, this happened at the intersection of Walker Avenue and Josephine Boyd Street. UNCG posted on its mm -hmm. Facebook page a short time ago the student's injuries are not believed to be life-threatening. Life and at this point, the Greensboro Police Department is handling the investigation. Also new tonight, the search for a missing woman from Burlington is over. This afternoon, authorities say crews searching for a Montgomery County landfill today very likely found Stephanie Cox's body. Investigators think she got into a trash bin at the Alamance Crossing Shopping Center in Burlington last Thursday, but did not get out before it was emptied into a garbage truck. Cox's family told investigators she frequently picked out items from trash bins. After last week's flooding, we're in for a lot more rain in the triad. Only 10 days in, but man, February mm -hmm. has been wet, wet so far. Let's go to Chief Meteorologist Laney Pope to let us know what we can expect mm -hmm. the rest of this week. Laney. We definitely have rain in the forecast. It started just after lunchtime today. You can see the wet skies over Winston-Salem. We do have rain out there right now as well, and it's all moving in from the southwest. So expect rain to continue overnight. It may not be steady overnight, but it will definitely fill back in toward tomorrow morning. Now we have light rain from Winston-Salem to Greensboro and Reedsville. It's a little bit heavier as you work your way out to the west over Iredell County, also Yadkin and Davie County. Again, this is moving northeast in the general direction of the triad. We've got a warm front positioned here, and a lot of that moisture is tracking right along that. So we do have a real good chance of rain. Also some fog in the overnight hours, especially in the foothills and the mountains. As that warm front lifts north, we may actually see temperatures go up just a little bit by daybreak tomorrow. We've got off and on rain this week, so another one to three inches of rain is possible. And we'll also bring back the cold air. We've got a lot to talk about. I'll be back with your full weather forecast coming up. Lenny, thank you. And of course, last week's storms were to blame for flooded roads, damaged buildings, lots yeah. of downed trees. Since then, we haven't had much of a break for people to get a look at the damage and clean everything up and move on. And as the rain continues tonight, our Brandon Bates takes us to Yakinville. We talked to a restaurant owner who's still trying to pump water out of his basement as more rain falls from the sky. Jim's grill in Yatkinville took a pounding from last week's storms. We went on home because there was tornado watches and flash floods and roads closed and trees down. With the owner out of town, Dina Watts watched the storm progress from the dining room. All of a sudden, water from a nearby creek overflowed, sending hundreds of gallons straight for Jim's grill. It was a little scary when we did realize that the whole basement was full of water. <laughs> and our boss was out of town. Last week's storms that rolled through Yadkinville filled up this basement with water almost above my head. And if I was standing there on Thursday, I'd be gasping for air in this muddy water that made its way inside. It looked like a river flowing out here. The restaurant owner, Robert York, sent his employees home, not knowing the risk they were up against. I felt like it might be too dangerous because if it got in the electrical, it could cause some electrical problems or it was thunder and lightning pretty bad too. The Yadkinville Fire Department pumped a lot of water out of the basement and it was starting to dry. But the forecast has different plans. With more wet weather on the way, employees say they're hopeful the restaurant can hold up and the rain can hold off. We hope that doesn't happen again, just put it that way. Reporting in Yadkinville, Brandon Bates. Some dry weather, <laughs> a lot of sunshine, be great. WXII 12 News. Well, next to some remarkable video in the aftermath of Thursday's rain and flooding, it took out the only road into and out of a community in Lincoln County, North Carolina. There's the road. It's gone. The moment the road gave way was filmed. County officials say this is a private road, so it's going to be up to the neighbors to fix this. The 11 families impacted say it's not a matter of how they'll make the repairs. Most of the people who live right here lived on a fixed income. The ones who work, you know, I mean, you got 18 people lives on the road, you got five people at base. $20 a month. Now, how long do you think it would take to pay for a $70,000 hole? 
Some people right now are trying to crowd fund to pay for a new road there. Several agencies are working with them, doing welfare checks and also providing meals. Remember, you can always get alerts on severe weather right on your phone by downloading the free WXII 12 News mobile app. New tonight, helping our children feel safe and secure. That's the topic of a community forum in High Point. The Oakview Citizens Council partnered with the United Way of Greater High Point for tonight's event, and people heard from a panel of experts who talked about how violence impacts young people. I think we've got some individuals that realize maybe for the first time or in a long time that they personally can do something, that they can invest some time and maybe just impact the life of one child, you know. Uh, I think that was very, uh, very much achieved. I'm going to go on and plan the next forum. The Oakview Citizens Council is working on a program for 14 through 16 year olds to build confidence and leadership skills to help distract them from joining gangs. Looking at to tomorrow, Greensboro's new police chief plans to hold the first of eight community meetings. Ryan James is sworn in on January 31st. He says he wants to talk with the community about public safety issues, particularly in neighborhoods, and give people the chance to meet the officers who serve them. Tomorrow's meetings from 630 until 8 at Barber Park Event Center on Barber Park Drive. You can see the full schedule for these meetings right now on WXI12.com. Investigators say they now know what caused a deadly weekend house fire in Winston-Salem. They are blaming a candle in the living room. The fire broke out at around 4 in the afternoon yesterday on Inwood Drive in the city. Firefighters found the victim, 69-year-old Judy Snyder, in the hallway. The medical examiner says Snyder likely died from smoke inhalation at the scene. Tonight in 12 Investigates, a candidate for U.S. Congress says she went to jail for a crime she did not commit. But now that candidate's using the arrest as part of her campaign to win the Democratic primary in the state's sixth congressional race. But as Bill O'Neill found out, there is more to this story. Rhonda Fox claims that she was the victim in this case, but the police investigation tells a much different story. Rhonda Fox, one of five candidates running in the Democratic primary for North Carolina's sixth congressional district, posted her version of what happened on social media. She says a neighbor at this Washington, D.C. apartment building assaulted her in September of 2018, but that she was the one who ended up getting fingerprinted, photographed, and booked into a jail cell for 12 hours. Fox writes online, quote, This isn't just my story. It's a story that nearly 13 million Americans face each year in our district courts. It is the story of our woefully broken criminal justice system. The police investigation tells a much different story. Investigators who looked into the incident ended up charging Fox with assault and making threats to do bodily harm. According to the police report, this whole incident started over dogs riding in an elevator in that Washington, D.C. apartment building. According to two witnesses, an unnamed neighbor with two dogs in the elevator had asked Ms. Fox not to enter the elevator with her dog. Fox didn't enter the elevator, but according to the witnesses, a short time later, Fox confronted her neighbor in the courtyard below. One witness told police Fox accused her neighbor of being racist, saying she didn't want her on the elevator because she's black, and heard Fox say, quote, I'll kill you, using the B word, and calling the neighbor, quote, ghetto, again, using the B word. A second witness told police she heard Fox make the same comments, adding it looked like Fox threw a punch or slap that may have grazed the neighbor's face. According to the police report, security footage from the apartment building shows Fox appearing to lunge at her neighbor, but the motion-activated camera doesn't show any grabbing, striking, or punching by either woman. The unnamed neighbor told police that Fox grabbed her by the neck and choked her. Fox told police she didn't choke or strike her neighbor, accusing the neighbor of striking her. Police note that during their interview, Fox, quote, became belligerent and stated she was not going to answer any further questions before she talks with her attorneys. Roughly eight months after the incident, the charges against Rhonda Fox were dropped. Late this afternoon, the neighbor who accused Fox of assault told us by phone the only reason she dropped the charges is because she moved out of the area. Christina McGlossen says that she is a former federal prosecutor. She also tells us she now regrets dropping the charges after learning that Ms. Fox is running for Congress. We reached out to Rhonda Fox for an interview this afternoon. We did not hear back. 
In Greensboro, I'm Bill O'Neill, WXII 12 News. Thank you, Bill. Turning to Commitment 2020 now. President Trump spent his evening in Manchester, New Hampshire, where he's going to rattle Democrats with a rally of his own. He's riding high from his acquittal in the impeachment trial and launched an assault on the Democrats who tried to remove him from office and Nancy Pelosi for her performance during a State of the Union address. That prompted the crowd to break into a lock her up chant. You know, it's very distracting. I'm speaking and a woman is mumbling terribly behind me, angry. There was a little anger back there. We're the ones should be angry, not them. We're and while this rally was happening, the Democratic presidential candidates continued to make their final push ahead of tomorrow's New Hampshire primary. A new Quinnipiac poll has Senator Bernie Sanders leading nationally, followed by former Vice President Joe Biden and former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg. Looking ahead, two of those three candidates will be making stops in our state later this week. Mike Bloomberg has events on the calendar marking the beginning of the early voting period here in our state on Thursday. He's set to visit Winston-Salem and Greensboro that day, then Raleigh on Friday. And the Sanders campaign says he will be in Raleigh Friday morning and in Charlotte later that afternoon. Early voting runs from Thursday through February 29th. You can only vote for the party in which you are registered. If you are unaffiliated, you can choose the Democrat or Republican ballot. You will not need an ID for early voting or to vote in the March 3rd primary. The primary, by the way, three weeks from tomorrow. North Carolina is one of several states with a primary on what's called Super Tuesday.